All right, guys, uh, I'm going to introduce our, our next speaker. Uh, so, Steve Arata has a company called Revo that has created something truly unique. Uh, VO2 Max uh, is something I can't support, but he can. But the point is, VO2 Max uh, is, is a, a measurement of your fitness level. And usually it's measured with an oxygen mask. But his team has been able to put together an algorithm to figure out how to, how to measure a VO2 max without an oxygen mask and to get the, the cost down so that way you can use something as simple as a home exercise bike like this to be able to, to measure VO2 max. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Steve Raj. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. So this all started when George kind of walked into this center. We work from here, by the way, so you know, welcome to Bespoke. Um, so George walked in for a VO2 max test, and you know, he saw his, his numbers, and he really liked what he saw, and so he suggested that we come over and, and talk about what we're building. So before I start, this quick question. Have, have any of you heard of VO2 max before this event? Quite a few. Uh, have any of you done a VO2 max test before this? That's great. And if you've been curious about measuring your fitness level, but nearly haven't got around to doing it, and if you, okay, great. So this is an interest. It's a good audience, to talk to. So yeah, a lot of a lot of people have experienced already. So that's terrific. Um, so VO2 max is basically the max amount of oxygen your body can uptake per kilo of body weight per minute. So it's in a simplest way of thinking about it is that it's like a hundred point scale. Right, three is the amount of oxygen your body needs when it's sleeping. And oxygen obviously is critical for human survival, right? If you don't breathe, you don't live. So we need oxygen to create, to break down glucose, to provide energy. So, and in simple terms, the higher the number, the more your capacity for physical effort. So that's the simplest way of thinking about what VO2 max means, right? And it is, um, it's been you know, measured for, for a long time in, you know, from a scientific perspective, and people have been looking at health indicators. It's also been something that's been used with elite athletes for quite a while. So we have a lot of data and understanding about how this number actually relates to various parts of um, human performance, human health, etc. So you know, so it is one of the best indicators of physical fitness, athletic potential, as well as overall health. So the American Heart Association says it's the most important cardiovascular overall health, single best predictor of cardiovascular disease, single best predictor of all cause mortality. So your VO2 max number basically can tell what is your risk of dying in the next 10 years. Period. So that's the best number. Uh, it's also used by elite athletes as an indicator of uh, overall potential. So typically, elite athletes have double the VO2 max and numbers of the average um, person. So and that is a necessary condition, not sufficient, but it's a necessary condition for you to be successful. Um, so how does how did I get into this? Why is it interesting to measure VO2 max? So not too long ago. I turned 40 and I discovered that I was trying to see my blood pressure rise. And this is a bit scary because I've seen my dad go through three heart attacks over 10 years, so I knew that, you know, most serious stuff was down the line. And you'll see here my data. So that's when I got into, and I'd been pretty active. I built a fitness app uh, using the accelerometer early days of the iPhone, almost like a Fitbit and iPhone. So I knew I was pretty active, but clearly that activity wasn't sufficient to keep me healthy and keep me fit. So I was curious about what is going on. I want to get something a bit more scientific that, give, that, give me, that could give me a good sense of where I was and what I need to do to improve. And so after some work, the first prototype and the first measurement really that was robust was sometime in the end of August. And so my VO2 max score was 30. And my blood pressure was 120.85, which is kind of uh, mild hypertension, basically. And I was obese. So that is kind of the data. Um, 30 basically is where we see correlation today between blood VO2 max score and blood pressure and type 2 diabetes. So between 20 to 30 is where you see a lot of correlation between these, these two data sets. Um, and so then I kind of start, since I was able to measure myself pretty regularly, I knew exactly what I was doing. Um, and so I started to do pretty intense exercise according to at least what I, was, what I thought was intense at that point. Right? And so it was six second intervals, three times a week. I was hitting my max heart rate repeatedly during a session. Uh, I lost you know, a certain amount of weight, I lost 10 pounds. Uh, so clearly it was working, at least in some respect, but it did not change my blood pressure, it did not change my VO2 max score either. Right? So in one respect it was very disappointing, I was almost beginning to think that hey, maybe there is a generic uh, reason why I can't improve my fitness anymore. Right? But also it was interesting to see that my, 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 sorry, my blood pressure anymore, but it was also interesting that my fitness hadn't changed. So clearly there was something in what I was doing wasn't really working. But because I had this benchmark and this baseline, I could then change what I was doing in terms of training. And one of the things that I was resisting doing was really increasing the intensity, reducing the time, because 
I was still in this belief that you had to put a certain amount of time into your workout to actually see a benefit. But then I decided to cut the intensity um, and then increase the intensity and cut the time I exercised literally by half. Uh, and so I was training much closer to my max, which I had already measured. And then the results were just dramatic within a few weeks. What hadn't changed for six months started changing within a few weeks. And I went from 31 to 33. My blood pressure normalized. There wasn't any change in weight in this period. But all the changes were physiological in terms of how my fitness level changed. And so today, you know, I've continued to kind of evolve the training. So now I do high intensity 10 minute sessions daily. And that's continued to help me push up my numbers. So, and I've lost weight as well in the process. Um, any questions before I continue? Okay. So, how is VO2 max traditionally measured? It is measured in a fitness lab or a performance lab, and occasionally in a, in a medical center in a hospital. So, we heard of the term stress test. So stress test is usually done for people who've had a, a cardiovascular event usually, or a very high risk of cardiovascular event. Uh, but usually, you know, a lot of people who test voluntarily are performance athletes who are looking to understand themselves. And so this, this, is, this is a gold standard power medics kit with a Velotron bike. Power medics cost 45K, Velotron cost 8K. Uh, so it's an expensive piece of kit. It's also a lot of consumables, and a lot of effort goes into calibrating this and setting up the system. So on average, a VO2 max test would cost about $150. Um, in a reputable lab today, right? And it's also cumbersome for the lab technicians who are usually requires a lot of people being present. They're, you know, they're trying to make sure that you don't, they don't kill you while they do the test. Um, and I don't want to scare you, but it can push you. You're pushing per the person to the limit, so you have to be confident that you're not pushing the person beyond where they can go, right? And since you're wearing an oxygen mask, you really can't talk, so you have to use hand signals to communicate. So that's the only way your trainer can figure out have you reached a limit or not. So which also is kind of makes it a bit more scary. And it's suffocating. It's very difficult to actually So even early that if you do a lot of we've been doing lab testing, even some of the people who are very high in terms of fitness who are kind of regularly pushing themselves and suffering, you know, are not very happy repeating a VO2 max test in a lab uh, than the traditional way. So you know as a result very few people actually do the test today. Um, so a number of other alternatives and you believe none of them are perfect, but I just want to walk you through some of them because they may be interesting for you to try out. Um, there, is, there are cheaper uh, products that do VO2 max testing. Car is an example. Um, and the auto calibrate, so it makes it a little bit easier. It costs about $10,000, $9,000. Um, we still don't know how accurate it is. They haven't published any big, reasonable size of data. There's an N of 4 comparing versus power medics. And there's still no control over protocol. And one of the things you find is that protocol really makes a difference. So we've been testing in labs. And between labs, having exactly the same piece of kit for the same individual, within a week, we get up to 20% Variation. So today it's still very much an art in terms of you know doing a VO2 max test. You have to know how to warm that person up. You have to be confident about pushing someone to the limits, you know, and so on and so forth. So so it does require the uh, the person actually doing the test to have real experience doing it before you can actually get a successful result. Um, Garmin actually has and and a couple of other products also now have VO2 max estimation inbuilt into them. So I don't know if any of you have used Garmin or tried Garmin. Um, it uses technology built by a company called First Beat. It's a Finnish company, really cool. And what they try to do is use real-world data with all the noise that's in, in it, but still get you a VO2 max estimate. Um, it combines heart rate data and the GPS data, basically. Um, it's a sub-max method. And so sub-max means you're not pushing someone to the max. You're basically cutting them off at some point uh, that is less than the max, and then you're ex extrapolating to figure out what their max could be. And in general, submax methods are much more variability in terms of the numbers we get. So it works OK on average, but obviously there's a long tail in terms of the error margins. It's very dependent on their estimate of your max heart rate. And we find that you know, as making assumptions about max heart rate versus age-based formulas, again, there's a lot of variation. So we get a lot of people who never reach their age predicted max. We get people who you know, exceed their age predicted max by quite a degree. So there's a lot of variation in those things. Plus, the, big, the bigger challenge of submax is reliability. So you will get day-to-day -day fluctuations when you're inputting this data in, because it's just the nature of the data that you're collecting. It's very noisy. So there's much more reliability issues. But it's, but it's better than nothing. It's good to have some indication of where you are, I think, uh, than not have anything. The last one, which is the non-exercise method, the only way to measure VO2 max without getting off the couch, is to use the VO2 max calculator. So one of the things I personally like is this one that was done by uh, one, a Netherlands University. And it's actually built on pretty large uh, data set, almost 100,000, 200,000 people. Uh, 100,000, I think. Oh, no, sorry, 70,000, 35,000 men, 35,000 women. Uh, Worldfitnesslevel.org, so it's easy to remember. Um, it gives you a rough, rough estimate, but it's very input dependent. So for example, it'll, it gives a plus 10 estimate for my 
viewer to max and tell me it's 54 where it's, I know it's 46. Um, and so, and it really depends on your inputs about how active you are, how, how much your max heart rate is, how much your resting heart rate, and so on. So again, there's variation on some of this, but it'll give you some idea of where you are. Uh, the challenge, as you can see, none of them really solve this, the problem in terms of making something that's simple to use that you know, we could get a lot of people to do, but yet give us very high levels of accuracy. And so that's a large part of the reason why we really built Revo, because you didn't want to compromise on accuracy, but you wanted something that we could have virtually anyone with varying levels of fitness be able to use and not find the process too painful. Can I, sorry, can I just sure. I think you're missing like, your biggest Right. So it's kind of similar to, so there's a number of, uh, I've just picked one example in terms of Garmin, but there's a number of others that do. Peer Sports, for example, has a heart rate based measurement. Polar does. All of them fundamentally are affected by the same challenges, which is that, you know, these are sub max methods, they don't necessarily. Because it doesn't do any exercise, just lie on your bed for 10 minutes. Right, and then even, even less accurate, basically, therefore. So, yeah, yeah. So if fundamentally, if you don't do a max test, you won't get accurate data. All submax protocols are affected by the same. Uh, so if you look at first beat, for example, and they've actually been very good about publishing the results, you'll see that one of the things they point out is that it really depends a lot on their assumptions about max heart rate, which, is, which will also affect if you're kind of taking a resting heart rate based method, which is what Polar does. Right? So all of them are affected by your assumptions about max heart rate. Any other questions? So, so essentially, Revo's goal is to make it easy to measure VO to max so we can get virtually everyone to do it. Because we believe personally, and from my own experience, that this is probably the single most useful piece of data that we can know about the human body. Um, it's innovative because we use cycling power and heart rate sensors. We don't use the oxygen mask. Uh, we've tried to make the experience engaging. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm always kind of, when I put the word engaging out there, I know that it's going to be different for different people, but hopefully it's really easy because it's, it just guides you through the whole process. There's actually little need for a trainer to be present. The app does a lot of the work, and that's kind of the advantage of being able to work with uh, sensors and apps, which is that you can actually guide people through it. Trainer's still a good person to be there to be able to walk people through the data because a lot of the value that comes out of a test is actually understanding the data and making sense of it. So, and then the reports hopefully are intuitive and easy to understand. A lot of our work is ready to help people, you know, benchmark themselves, find, you know, connect this data to other personal goals they have, uh, and make meaning out of this data. Um, this is some of our early results. We've, we've uh, tested versus Power Medics, the gold standard kit, and we're finding about 0.96 in terms of uh, accuracy across a pretty wide spectrum of people. So a lot of the measurement that is done, for example, first week, only does it with athletes. They don't do it with the entire. So we, uh, our goal right from day one was to make sure that we can work with people who are high in terms of fitness, and we can also work with people who for pretty high cardiovascular risk. So that's the spectrum that we wanted to. We've done over 500 fitness tests so far, from people who have competitive athletes to those who've just had a bypass. So you know, we believe we can actually, we built a system that can actually work across a large group. Um, and then let's do the demo. So we're not going to do a full test because it takes on average about 15 minutes. We're just going to give you a quick view of how the app actually works. Um, So you, you cycle for 30 seconds, stop completely for 30 seconds, and then you cycle it up, higher intensity for 30 seconds. The increment is going to be 30 watts each time. Right. 
And basically the goal is to get you to the point where you're struggling to maintain the target for the duration of 30 seconds. So that's, so we know you've kind of reached or breached your max. And what we try to do is estimate what's the max power you can, you can generate over 30 seconds. And then we use the, um, um, and yeah, don't worry about it for now. And then we use the heart rate data to figure out how much of that max power is aerobic and how much of the max power is anaerobic. Because all power is not aerobic, so we need to figure out how much of that max power is aerobic, and that's how we estimate the max aerobic output. And then each time he stops, it's also measuring recovery, so it looks at how much the heart rate drops in that 30 seconds. And we compute that across the entire range of stress levels, so we get an independent estimate of recovery as well. Um, so he's wearing a polar heart rate monitor. So we only use polar because we find that that gives us much more accurate data. So the technology is all purely in the back of the side. Correct, absolutely, absolutely. And trying to so, figure out like, how many different Correct, exactly. So the core value add is in the data science and the software there. And the protocol, so the protocol is, is what's innovative. So traditional, um, so a conventional fitness assessment would be a one minute, uh, continuous, it's usually a continuous protocol. They, they will not do an intermittent protocol. Right? The independent protocol is what actually is the, gives us the magic sauce. So each time it's stopping, we can read how this heart rate is responding to different levels of stress. So each time it starts. And that's what allows us to tease out what kind of fuel is burning at different intensities. And in the end, we can figure out how much of that final output is aerobic. So the key for us is the intermittent protocol. And so, and so yeah, the data and the intermittent protocol is what gives us the ability to measure what we measure. And why is that? Because continuous, there's a lot of, uh, there's an overlay of data, basically. So if you're doing a continuous protocol, essentially you can't tease out um, heart rate response to that continuous effort as nicely as you can in a protocol, because you get an overlay of effects. This heart rate inherently has lag, so, so you'll see a drift in heart rate, you know, usually takes about two, three minutes for it to settle down. Like, by the time you've gone on to the next level, by the time you've gone on to the next level. So, so with independent protocol, they get a more cleaner read of how the heart rate is on in different So, in fact, funnily enough, the, when, when real time testing was first done, the, the guy who originally invented real time testing was working with independent protocol. And you know, it's always interesting to go back and look at how science evolves. And somewhere along the line, it, it moved to a continuous protocol, and you know, and things have been that way since then. Is there anything other than this kicker? Uh, no, so we use, we use a kicker because kicker firstly is pretty accurate, it's you know, plus minus 3%. Secondly, it gives us you know control over the resistance, so if you notice he's not playing with any knobs, etc. It automatically changes the resistance. We control the resistance slightly because that gives us much more accuracy. For us, you know, everything else is controlled, you cannot move your seat position. So I can do this at home for my kicker? You wouldn't be able to because for us, the frame is also a measuring device. Okay. So this is you know set at gold standard. So a lot of the road bikes are will have a different position, seat position. Mountain bikes will have a different seat position. Seat position matters. So it's only with bike controlling the entire measurement process that we can actually get anywhere close to those standards. So without that control, we wouldn't. Shall we stop him or let him cycle on forever? <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop because I'm conscious of kind of, uh, um, I'm just going to switch to the other iPad and uh, kind of George has finally consented to share his data. So I'm just going to walk you through a live output. Um, I thought I was in good shape. Apparently, I was average. <laughs> I, I think you're OK. I mean, it, look, no one's ever happy with their results. That's what I find. I mean, it's, I'm happy, very happy with my results, but a lot of people aren't. Okay, so here's, a, here's an output. So this is, what, this is kind of the core output that you'd see, which is your VO2 max score. Um, and then you get a sense of what, what kind of level you are at. Right. So we talked about VO2 max being a pretty big predictor of cardiovascular. So this is all. So any, for, a, for a male, VO2 max score below 20 means you have literally a 50% risk of mortality in the next 10 years. So that's how that scale is uh, built. Uh, and it's actually, there's like a million manuals of data behind that. So then 20 to 30 is where we see a lot of correlation between VO2 max and things like blood pressure and type 2 diabetes. And so the word sedentary and active are a little bit mistaken because we think of sedentary as doing nothing and active as kind of, you know, doing something. 
here what it means is that your body is functioning as if you had been sedentary for a long time and your body is functioning as if you've been active for a long time. So it's an indicator of how your body is functioning, not necessarily how active you've been in the last few weeks, right? And so it takes cumulative effort to really get your body to a place where it is, you know, in that shape. And athletic 56 plus is where we see compared to athletes, uh, university and national level, so that's how that scale is built. 76 plus is where you see elite athletes, so, you know, marathon winners, Tour de France, you know, Chris Froome, 82.6, Greg LeMond, I think 92, uh, 96, 97 is the highest ever measured for humans. 180 is the VO2 max for a thoroughbred horse. Then, if you want like an aspirational goal, so and that, and actually VO2 max is measured for horses. You know, it's, the, it's interesting if you go online and you see a lot of data. Um, and then you can compare against your age group. So, Judge, can you tell your age? <laughs> I'm 34. But, so, Judge, so the average for a 10 year old male is 42, and Judge doing better than his, the average for his age group. He's actually doing better. He's better than the average 15 year old male. So. There you go. Better than the average 15 year old. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So VO2 max peaks around 19 to 20, and after that, literally drops. Even if you're active, it drops 1% each year. And so a lot of the issues we see uh, are really because your, your physical capacity is declining at a certain rate. And of course, you can reverse some of that. It's not something that is a given. You can reverse it like you saw me do. Right? When I started, my VO2 max was, I was less fit than the average 60 year old male. Um, yeah, my, my score was 30. So and today I'm fitter than the average, I'm pretty close, I'm fitter than the average 20 year old, so I'm still, I still have to beat the uh, 15 year old. But it's so it's, that. that's why we're doing this stuff. Yeah, and so that's achievable. So in, in general we find that high intensity interval training, and high meaning you're training at your max, not just you know, anywhere in between, you're training as close to your own personal max as possible, right? Even with short durations, 20 seconds to 30 seconds per bout, Three to five times a session, you know, you don't need to do more than 10 to 12. It's really the intensity of the matter. So the original Tabata protocol, by the way. Tabata is like the most overused word in exercise today. Original Tabata protocol was done on Olympic ice skaters in Japan at 170% of their VO2 max, measured on a bike, and they cycled for 20 seconds, 10 second recovery, 20 seconds, three to five intervals in a session, three times a week. So, but it was at 170%, and they got a 28% improvement in the VO2 max over six weeks. So it is intensity that seems to make a lot of difference to outcomes when it comes to VO2 max. Because really what you're trying to do is push your roof and you've got to train like really close. You've got to put, train at your personal point of failure for you to see that improvement. Uh, we also measure recovery. I know I'm taking up a lot of time. Recovery, which in this case is good. Recovery, and we find that there's a 60% correlation between the two, right? Um, and so in this case, actually, George is perfectly in sync. And then there's a lot more detail that comes out of the test. So the real value of the VO2 max test is that it gives you an understanding of your thresholds and your training zone. And, you know, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the word lactate threshold or anaerobic threshold or functional threshold. So we basically call it threshold because that's exactly the same thing. Single best factor of endurance events. So VO2 max is a 65% correlation with endurance performance. Your threshold is a 90 95% correlation. So that's the number that's really meaningful when it comes to predicting endurance performance, whether it's cycling or running. Um, and in general, it can vary from anywhere from about 50% to 90% of your max. So the real so training is all about taking that potential, which is your to max, and then you know building efficiency and building output that builds your threshold. So, and then you also see zones, which are personalized to you. So you understand where you're burning fat and where you transition to burning carbohydrates and so on. Um, I'm going to stop. So we've taken up a lot of time. So, any questions? What a threshold business model? When you start the fight, so you fight something to You're starting with the toughest question. <laughs> So, what we're still learning about that, right? Uh, we've had we're selling into we're selling bikes now. So, we're selling into university labs. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of interest from gyms. We still haven't sold any bikes to fitness centers or gyms. A lot of this work has been pretty recent. So, we recently finished a lot of the validation, and so this month and next month we're doing a lot of uh, events as well as uh, pilots and gyms, right? We're also selling to individual users. So, we've had people you know buy it as an exercise bike for use at home because once you figure out the person's thresholds and training zones, it's really easy then, uh, I mean, easy is a relative word, but at least it's possible to get that person to train at the right uh, intensity, right? And when you train at the right threshold, you see much quicker improvements, like you saw for me, compared to if you're shooting in the blind. So, yeah, so we're seeing a mix of things, and we're still trying to understand where our opportunity is. I'm sorry we don't have any more time for questions. Uh, you'll have to ask Siva after we're done. We still have one more presentation, uh, and we do need to be out of here by nine. So. Uh, I apologize for running over. This is my lesson to learn is, is understanding how to do, oh, thank you. How, whoops. How to actually uh, uh, run a meetup on time. That's my, so.